Welcome, everybody. Before we get fully started, we have a message from the director of our center. So I'm going to play that now. Center at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. At Aqua Aurora, we consider bi and multilingualism as a dynamic process across the lifespan, and we investigate how the two or more languages uh, influence each other in the mind of the multilingual. We investigate what linguistic and other factors are involved, as well as the neurocognitive effects of multilingualism on the brain. At Aqua Aurora, we also make an effort to communicate current knowledge about multilingualism to the general public. I'm therefore very pleased to introduce one of our leading scholars, Professor Jason Rothman, who will be talking about facts and myths about bilingualism, mind, brain, and more. Um, let me tell you just a little bit more about Aqua Aurora because, as I mentioned, what we do is so much more. There are four research themes in Aqua Aurora. Theme one uh, relates to multilingual minds and factors affecting multilingual outcomes. So essentially looking at individual differences and, and kind of navigating through the waters of how we might understand individual outcomes and individual, individual trajectories and paths within the bilingual experience uh, of, of acquiring more than one language. Theme two is multilingual minds and cross-linguistic influence. So this is something that if you, if you look at language, whether you're a lay person or whether you're a researcher, you will notice that languages tend to influence each other across a lifespan, across space, across time. And that theme is dedicated to uh, looking into that uh, aspect of bilingualism much more deeply. Uh, theme three is multilingual minds and closely related varieties. This is something that's near and dear to the hearts of people uh, who work within the group and has been for a very long time, not least because of the dialectal variation that exists in a very special way um, in the Norwegian context where people really don't accommodate at all uh, and speak their dialects and seemingly magically, everybody seems to understand each other nonetheless, despite significant differences at, at, at all levels of, of, of uh, at all levels of and domains of grammar. Um, and theme four, which I will focus a little bit more on today, is multilingual minds and, and neurocognitive adaptations, including changes to the brain. Okay, so uh, within Aqua Aurora, we have uh, two labs, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little video because pictures speak louder than, than words do sometimes. Um, I'm going to show you a little video about the Polar Lab, the Psycholinguistics of Language Representation uh, Laboratory, where we do a lot of the uh, mind and brain related research. tracks the eye movement of the participant. So we show them a light on the screen and we track how the eyes move from one of the images depending on So basically what we're trying to do in the lab is we're trying to understand um, how people process and use language and we're very interested in bilingualism. So what this really cool method allows us to do is to understand um, changes in electrical activity that are happening in your brain while you're processing language. show you actually like how like some brain waves look like here you have what's called the raw EEG and then when we're able to analyze the data something like as pretty as this uh, comes out.
Okay, so I'm um, actually that 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 uh, cool effect was for was for somebody in the audience. So um, I'm going to take the opportunity to 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 do a shameless plug before we get started. We're, we're currently um, doing a study on. Um, uh, related to Northern Norwegian um, and exposure to Northern Norwegian. So if you are watching this, whether it be at the museum, whether it be online, or you see uh, a recording of this in the next couple months, please take that email down, polarlab.trumpso at gmail.com. Get in touch with us. We will also give you a 250 kroner gift certificate to, uh, to Yekta, but that's not why you should do it. Um, you will be able to participate in that really cool ladder methodology that you just saw, which is looking at uh, your brain waves as you process language, and in this case, processing um, Norwegian. So all you need to do is be a native speaker of Norwegian. Doesn't matter where you come from. We want you. Please get in touch with us, okay? And then you'll be part of this really cool research. So today, as promised, what I'm going to do is try to make this as user-friendly and useful for everybody, from parents to stakeholders to policymakers to those of you who are bilingual yourselves. Uh, because I'm giving this primarily for a Norwegian audience, you, are, you must be bilingual because you're listening to me in a language that's probably not your native language. Um, and uh, well, I probably shouldn't have said that because I actually want to know before we get started what you take bilingualism to be. So let me just ask you, who counts as a bilingual? What is a bilingual? Am I bilingual? I, I speak several languages, but natively just one. Am I a bilingual? Are you a bilingual? Um, how many of you, there's an audience here, so I'm just gonna peer my eye over the computer for a second. How many of you raise your hands if you know, or you think you know what a bilingual is? The, no trick questions, by the way, I'm not trying to trick anybody. So most of you know what a bilingual is. Fantastic, let's see if you actually know what a bilingual is. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to read a series of scenarios, real people or versions of, of, of potential real people. And all you have to do is decide whether you think they should qualify as a bilingual um, or not. And if they do, you have one point and you need to keep a tally. You'll have a total of seven, I believe, um, if you think all of them are bilinguals or any number between zero and seven, if you think none or somewhere in between the, the, uh, the maximum number are bilinguals. Does that sound like something that we can all do? So if you're at home or if you're at the museum, just you know, try to remember seven things or you know, take your phone out and put a little dash and make a note, okay? So I'm gonna read seven scenarios to you. The first is Bjorn, and Bjorn was born here in Tromsø. His father is native Norwegian. His mother though is from Italy. At home, Italian is the language his mother exclusively uses with him. Bjorn is a naturalistic, simultaneous bilingual of Norwegian and Italian, and relatively balanced in comprehension and speaking abilities in both. You know, for his age, he looks like he's probably 10, 11, or 12. So adult-like, right? However, he cannot read or write in Italian as he goes to a Norwegian monolingual school. So let's assume that at the appropriate level, he could read and write in Norwegian. Is he bilingual? Is Bjorn bilingual? If yes, you have a one. If not, you still have zero. Brandon is from New York City, where I'm from as well. His parents are from Jamaica. He speaks a typical New York English variety, very similar to what I'm using right now, as well as Jamaican Creole, which was the language spoken to him as a young child. If you're not aware, Jamaican Creole is an English-based Creole, so I just provided for you some sentences here. I'm not going to embarrass myself and try to pronounce them because one of the most salient differences is the pronunciation. But as you can see, okay, I'll try to do one. Me soon come, I'll be right back. So you can see it's quite based on English, but there's salient differences between the two. Is he a bilingual because he speaks and understands both of these varieties? Ping was born in Berlin to parents who are immigrants. They are native Mandarin speakers from Beijing. For whatever reason, they only spoke German and their second language learners of German, but they decided to only speak German to him when he was a child. He did not start to learn Mandarin until he went to university, where he started studying it quite intensely at the age of 19. Now at 24, he's really good at speaking and understanding Mandarin, probably reading and writing because he learned it in a school setting, but he sounds quite different from his parents. Should we consider him bilingual? If so, you have a three. 
Mireia was born in Seville. This is in southern Spain. We would all like to go visit again, I'm sure, at some point soon. It's very sunny there, a little hot in the summer. But her family is from Barcelona. So Barcelona is in the north of Spain um, and a place where the, the predominant language in society can be and as often is Catalan, okay, which is another Romance language, but another distinct language like Portuguese is a distinct language. She learned Spanish and Catalan as first languages in her home. When she started school, however, she began to use Catalan less and less. At the age of 14, she now never produces Catalan, but she can understand it pretty well. Is Mireia a bilingual? Ana Lucia is from Portugal. At 19, she moved to Brazil. Now in her early 30s, she has adapted to the Brazilian variety of Portuguese while in Brazil, the majority of her time. And she uses it with her children who were born in Brazil. But when she speaks to her family very often and, and who are in Portugal, there's no question that she reverts back to European Portuguese. Is she a bilingual? That's very relevant for the Norwegian context if you're all thinking about it. Tamer. Tamer's 28 years old. He was born in Hyderabad, which is in India. His native language is Hindi. He began to take English at a relatively young age and became highly proficient in his late teens when he realized he absolutely wanted to go study in the UK. A graduate of Oxford University now, he lives and works in the UK. Is he a bilingual? Nade is 17 and she's from London. Although there's no cultural connections whatsoever, her parents enrolled her in the Lycée Francais in London, which is a French immersion school based on the French national education system. So primarily French speaking, in fact, all exclusively French speaking, except for English classes like they would be in France. As a result, she can pass for a native speaker of French. However, at home, on the weekends, typically with friends, even those that are in her same school and with all her family, she speaks only English. Can we consider her a bilingual? And finally, Betsy. Betsy's from Austin, Texas, and like many Americans, she was seemingly on track to be a lifelong monolingual until her eldest son did a study abroad in Sicily, never to return. Why? Because of course he fell in love. At the age of 50, she began to take Italian so that she could communicate with her grandchildren. So he got married and he had children. She is very far from perfect, but she handles herself quite well in Italian. And she even knows a little bit of Calabrese, which is, uh, again, a different language, really, dialect, as they refer to it in Italy, the local dialect, to get by when she is on the streets visiting her family. Is she bilingual? Okay. What's your number? You can have a number from seven to zero. I'm gonna ask the audience who's here, okay? But you, if you're at home or you're watching this, what's your number? How many of you have seven? All seven of them count as some type of bilingual. And if you don't study bilingualism, don't be pressured by the people in the room here who study bilingualism. How many of you have a seven? Oh, many of you. How many of you have a six? A five? One five. A four? A four? And a linguist. Three, two, one, one. Okay, very nice. So we have a range of one to seven. And by the way, this should underscore the journey we're about to take, to take on. I do this a lot. This particular game, I adapt depending on what I'm talking about, okay? But I do this in rooms, potentially hundreds of people there who are all linguists potentially all of whom study bilingualism. And the range is typically not one to seven, but it's never a consensus, okay? It's never a consensus. Think about that also if you're a student, because what does that mean? When we have disagreements in research, potentially labels that we take for granted, if we say bilingual in any study, we're of course talking about the same thing. Maybe we're not, okay? Maybe we're not. So let me, um, let me show you what I did actually. I, I took some, uh, some variables and I kind of played with them, but in a verbal form to kind of trick you, right? So I could ask, are some of the factors that were folded into the descriptions potentially more important than others? The answer has to be yes, if you had a three compared to somebody who had a five. You are equating, using, and evaluating this label by different factors. And some of them are the environmental context, perhaps proficiency, 
maybe you think if somebody can't read and write, then they're not a bilingual. Um, that's problematic because there are lots of people in the world who are literate in a language that has a system, and there's lots of languages that don't have written systems. So literacy potentially is not something or is something, depending on what you're looking at. Time or age of acquisition. Potentially, if somebody is a second language learner, even if they're very successful, well, that's not bilingualism, that's second language learning. Well, we'll see. Maybe cultural ties. Perhaps Nade can't qualify as a, uh, as a bilingual because although she speaks two languages, uh, they, it's not something that belongs to her cultural domain. Maybe there's some confusion within the room, online, wherever you are, about what constitutes a language. Is Brazilian Portuguese a language? Um, compared to European Portuguese. For those of you who don't study Romance languages, it is, okay? I, I mean, it, it, in the most relevant sense of, of linguistic analysis, it is, it is quite different. A, a potentially highly mutually intelligible uh, uh, variety uh, or, or language, but nonetheless quite different. So we can ask ourselves, are any of these factors more important than others? Yes and no. And as researchers in particular, we need to be very clear about defining what we're talking about, especially when we want to make generalizable claims. Okay, so just kind of a footnote. So now let me tell you what a bilingual is, at least what I think, okay, and what many others think. So a bilingual is an individual who has knowledge, mental, a mental representation, that's gonna be key into some of the research that, or, or uh, effectively, you know, engaging underlying mechanisms that give rise to some of the outcomes of bilingualism that I'll talk about later. But it's, it's having knowledge, a mental representation of two or more languages for the purpose of understanding and or speaking these languages. By the way, there is a difference, but I'm gonna just gloss over them between by two and potentially more than that, which we would refer to as multilingualism. Okay, but for now, you'll just have to forgive me and um, I will uh, apologize in person and we can have a discussion, especially later if you have some questions about potential differences when we add more than two to the mix, okay? A native bilingual are those that have two native languages, sometimes called two L1ers, because they have two first languages, or simultaneous bilinguals. Some bilinguals become bilingual later in life, second language learners. These are known as sequential bilinguals. After the age of four and beyond, a person is considered a second language learner. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not important differences between child second language learning and adult second language learning. But after the age of four, for pretty robust and well-established reasons, the consensus is that you consider somebody um, no longer a simultaneous bilingual, but a second language learner. Some bilinguals are more proficient in their L2 than in their first language, okay? Uh, this can happen if you're an immigrant and you move. Maybe you stay somewhere for 30 years and you have less and less contact and you might just become dominant in the second language. You don't need to have perfect grammatical proficiency compared to, say, a native of the language for you in space and time to have that become your dominant language, okay? Language skills can vary on a spectrum from receptive understanding to full production comprehension with very subtle differences to monolinguals or uh, dominant native speakers, okay? Um, some bilinguals understand or seemingly understand uh, their second language or their other language in the case of child bilingualism very well, but seemingly are belabored to have much of any meaningful, especially in depth uh, discussions or conversations in that language. Okay, so let's talk about the context and some basic facts about bilingualism in general. And here, what you see in front of you are uh, a couple, uh, well, there's a map and then uh, to, to the right, or at least my right, you have uh, a nice poster and I'm gonna walk you through them, okay? So what I wanna give you is the global context. And a lot of people don't know this, especially in environments where A, there's a prevalence of a single dominant native language that happens um, in the Western world with, with much greater um, incidence than it does in the rest of the world. And we can see that in the map and I'll unpack it for you in a minute, okay? Um, but what you see in this map is understand it as, as, as such. The darker the green, the greater linguistic diversity. Now there are some places in the world, Papua New Guinea, for example, um, where there are over 800 
hundred languages. And Papua New Guinea is actually quite small. So the linguistic diversity index there is very large. By the way, if you look at Europe, I mean, Europe looks quite small because this is a world map. Of course, you can recognize where Norway is and good for Norway because that's a really sharp color green, even in comparison to other parts, uh, parts of Europe, okay? Um, but as, as I was saying, the lighter the color, the more yellow, the less diversity there is. And as you can see, the concentrations of societal bilingualism as such, or this isn't necessarily bilingualism, this is really about diversity of uh, language. However, what you can assume is that where there are greater incidences of language, they are in contact with each other, and this is the ripe ground for producing bilingualism. Okay, but what you can see is that, you know, across even North America, but especially in Africa and in certain parts of Asia Minor, um, uh, and of course in the Pacific and, and uh, at least the isles that appear to be super close to Australia, but if you take a plane, you'll see that they're not, there is a lot of very rich linguistic diversity. I'm going to show you some stuff about Norway in a minute, but you'll see that the number of languages that exist as native languages in Norway is actually quite high. If you turn your attention now to the multilingualism and the EU, you know, the EU, of course, is comprised of separate countries, but, a, but there is a, a program and an endeavor to have integration. And there are 24 um, official main languages of the European Union, but there's a recognition of 60 plus um, indigenous languages that coexist with these other languages, for example, Catalan, for example, Sami, for example, um, um, the, uh, the, in Ireland, what is it? Uh, the, what is that? Gaelic, thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Okay, Gaelic, so on and so forth, Welsh and so on and so forth, okay? So, so there's many languages. And of course, this isn't actually comprising the richness of the uh, immigrant languages that exist in the hundreds um, in the European context, okay? Now, uh, children and adults in, uh, in native dominant environments, of course, almost by force, whether they like it or not, even if there's effort involved, but often, and there's a lot of value in putting effort, there is a lot of bilingualism as a result of that. So what about Norway, okay? So the languages of Norway, of course, the main language of Norway, the official language and the dominant language is clearly Norwegian. As many of you know, there are two written standards, uh, Bukmal and Nynorsk. Um, but there's a coexistence of recognized languages within the, um, within the constitution of, of Norway. Um, and these include several indigenous languages like North, North Sami, which we're a big fan of up here, uh, Lul Sami, um, and, and so on, Kven and other languages. Um, now, it's not necessarily the case that there is a very large quantity of these speakers, but of course, these are recognized indigenous languages um, in the context of Norway. But in addition to that, there is 155 different languages, maybe be more because this number actually only represents languages spoken as first languages in the home by students who attend uh, comprehensive education in Norway. So all those speakers of those languages who are home language speakers of 155 different varieties, of course, are being educated in Norwegian, and that means all of them are going to be bilingual. And then, of course, we know English is so prevalent here that that probably means multilingualism, and most of Norway is at least bilingual, okay? Um, just to give you relative numbers, uh, just shy of a million documented immigrants exist in Norway, of which close to 800,000 are foreign-born, and about just under 200,000 are native born in Norway. So this is a large portion of, of second language learners like myself, I promise, I'm in the process. Um, and this constitutes just shy of 19% of the overall population of Norway. So while Norway is not a huge country, um, or uh, it is in landmass, but not necessarily population, as you can see, bilingualism is extremely important. And we're looking into the 90th percentile when you include that people are really highly proficient often second language learners in English. Okay, so let me give you some basic facts about bilingual children. We're all interested in children for, for many reasons, but we're interested in children in particular because is learning more than one language at the same time to the detriment of the other language? Does it cause confusion? So on and so forth. These were ideas, by the way, that were popularly held at least until the mid 1960s. So I'm gonna unpack some of these for you, okay? But here's some facts and then we'll get to myths as promised in the title. 
um, bilingual children are soon able to distinguish between their languages, remarkably so, remarkably so. Anybody who has bilingual children knows that they identify language with particular people and they'll have a concept of language beforehand. A two and a half year old might say, no, he speaks English. Ask a two-year-old in America what English is and they have no idea. There's no need for them to categorize language as such. They mix languages. And I'm gonna tell you now and again, many times, that's normal and that's fine, okay? Sometimes they start speaking a little bit later, okay? That's something to keep in mind. I'll talk a little more about that later, but they soon catch up. And I'm gonna show you some evidence to say that maybe they catch up and beyond, okay? Uh, they will often become dominant in one language over time, and that's okay. I, I have to say that in terms of balance of proficiency, balance of domains of use, balance of in every single way to, to have a child who's bilingual or even an adult, I have never, ever met if we're talking about completely and utterly indistinguishable. Maybe the grammatical systems are exactly the same. Maybe the, the way they pronounce is exactly the same, but undoubtedly language encodes much more than a representational system. And the way they use the language, of course, will be reflective of their environment, which will be different from where immigrant parents grew up and learned their language. So it's completely normal. But it's also been the case that uh, children can become quite unbalanced um, in at least their ability to communicate, um, less so in their comprehension. That's normal. And the benefits I'm going to talk about still seem to exist. Okay. Um, uh, bilingual children are under favorable conditions on par with monolinguals developmentally. So there's really nothing for you to worry about. If they're a little slower in language, even in general, calm down. They catch up. Okay. Um, and in some ways, they outperform them. Okay, they can differ from monolinguals in linguistic developmental milestones and even ultimate attainment. And I was referring to that in the penultimate thing that I discussed. They might be different, but different doesn't mean deficient. That's a big passion of mine, by the way, um, and for a different talk. Uh, they are not deficient, even when they show considerable differences to monolinguals. When we study bilingualism as linguists, when we study their, gr their grammars, when we study what they produce, there is wonderful and beautiful innovation and systematicity to their systems. It is different, but it's just as complex and is just as complete as a monolingual grammar. And they don't need constant correction because just like in the case of monolinguals, you're wasting your time. So if you wanna correct children, go right ahead. They will systematically ignore you because their grammars tell them otherwise. Okay, so here's some myths about uh, being bilingual. To be a real bilingual, maybe some of you use that in your definition, one must be like two monolinguals in a single person. So unless you're perfect, you're not a bilingual. As I mentioned, I've never met one, okay? And I'm pretty sure I've been studying bilingualism for about 20 years now. Okay, exposing children to more than one language will confuse them. Another common myth. Unfortunately, even some pediatricians and doctors still have this and convey this to families when it's just not true. Efforts to teach children bilingually robs them the critical exposure to the important language, disadvantaging them. First of all, let's not even get into what is an important language, but this is just factually not true. Even if in your mind you think a particular language has more social mobility or economic value than another, it's just a true, it's a false dichotomy. Some languages are more important than others. Not all languages should be promoted for bilingualism. It happens to be the case that my native language, which by the way, disenfranchises the native speakers of this language is used because it's a world language for economics. It's not because there's something great about English. In fact, it's quite weird, actually. Okay, so um, there is no language that's more or less important or more or less complete, or frankly, more or less complex. It's just from your perspective of comparison that something seems more complex. Teaching children bilingually with general and linguistic developmental delays is detrimental to them. This is actually a very important question, and it's a the answer to it is extremely important. Research shows that it doesn't disenfranchise them and potentially, with a big potentially question mark for more research, it might actually be facilitative and helpful. But the research is quite clear. If you, if you educate or teach a child bilingually and they have underlying um, either mental or developmental disorders, it is at least neutral for them and it's not extra confusing for them. So 
keep being bilingual. Reading and writing by literacy obtains in a home language simply by learning literacy in the majority language. So if you learn Norwegian uh, reading and writing at school, obviously you're going to know how to read and write um, Swedish, maybe because it's kind of close, or English. No, that's not the case. Mixing between two or more languages is a sign of deficiencies in bilingualism. We need to help them avoid it. And finally, this is an, uh, there's an age limit on learning language. All of us in this room are adults, don't even bother. I sure hope that's not true because I'm really trying to learn Norwegian, but I know it's not true. None of these things are true, okay? And none of these things are supported by actual academic research. They, 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 some of these things are quite intuitive. They make sense. A lot of what research does is to undo intuition because we don't want to just rely on intuition. If we did, there's lots of things technological and the like that we would be missing out on if we just relied on intuition at any given time. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about other benefits before I get into potential um, mind brain benefits because it's the benefits of bilingualism are much more diffuse and much more numerous than I might um, that, that might be obvious from what I'm going to focus on for the remainder of the talk after I talk about uh, uh, social benefits and economic benefits, but to highlight them for you, there are social benefits of being bilingual. Self-identity and culture. It allows children and people, not just the children themselves, but it allows societies to acknowledge and legitimize self-identity and cultural collect connections. If we, the more tolerance we have and the more we promote bilingualism, the more that greater society, whether you're bilingual or not, it becomes normalized and it is normal. It's normal, we saw that map, most people in the world, 60%, a minority of people do not have knowledge of more than one language. You wouldn't necessarily know that, as I said, in the Western world, which dominates seemingly everything, but it's just a fact, okay? It boosts the number of people with whom you can converse, obviously, right? And for social interaction. And importantly, it allows people to speak to their families abroad. It allows children to communicate with their, with their grandparents and grandparents potentially to communicate with their grandchildren, right? Um, there's a higher ability to recognize what uh, we and other people feel and finding ways to deal with and manage those emotions. So social flexibility has been linked to uh, increasing, um, increasing um, trends in bilingualism. A better understanding of other people's perspectives, so potentially even affecting things uh, related to the underlying cognition of that, like theory of mind. Um, easier to learn another third language. I actually researched this. I'm not so sure that's true, but a lot of people say it. So I put it on the list. Uh, but certainly in a metalinguistic way or in a classroom way, that experience and previous experience, uh, of course, can be used for anything moving forward. Why would language be any different? And being bilingual may boost your confidence in the dating market. This is a little tongue in cheek, but it's true. A Valentine's Day survey done by language software provider uh, Rocket Language revealed that 79% of people think someone who is bilingual is more attractive, okay? So maybe you can catch your significant other if you start breaking out your languages. Okay, there's also economic benefits, right? So discrepancy in earnings between monolinguals and bilinguals, for example, in the United States, uh, can be up to $5,400 annually, where that's actually rewarded, where bilinguals make more, okay? Especially in higher level jobs where they can communicate with different, um, with, with different communities. English monolingual students are 66% more likely to drop out of high school than balanced bilingual students, some research suggests. Um, Spanish bilingual, so a lot of this research, by the way, is done in the United States, so it's got a little centric to it. Spanish bilinguals were more likely to enroll in college than English monolingual Latinos, all else held equal. So what that means is people who are ethnically minorities, those that preserve their language, are much more likely to go to, on to further education than those that and potentially have been robbed a little bit of their identity and self-value by kind of suppressing the fact that they should be able to speak another language. A survey with 249 employers across all labor sectors revealed that at least two thirds of employers responded that, all things being equal, they had a preference for hiring bilinguals. Why not? They can tap other markets, right? Um, and bilingualism is indispensable for economics in, in a global sense, right? So there's, there's benefits to that too. 
Okay, so now as promised, and because the research day is, is really about um, um, the brain, we're gonna talk about the mind and brain a little bit, and we're gonna talk about research on bilingualism and neurocognition, okay? Um, and how many of you have heard that bilingualism exercises your brain, and bilingualism cures Alzheimer's, and bilingualism is this great you know, equalizer, and your brain just expands, and bilinguals are smarter? Raise your hand if you're in the room, if you've heard that. Okay, great. So that's fantastic. And that's what happens when we do research and news outlets uh, get a hold of things and they want catchy headlines. So let me give you some of these catchy headlines, right? Your mind on language, how bilingualism boosts your brain. Uh, learning a second language slows aging. Now, there is tr truth to some of this, but I'm going to try to unpack some of it for you because it's not a, as simplistic as that. It's not necessarily all bilingual. So if you just start learning with Duolingo, which I'm not saying is bad, by the way, if the programmers are listening, um, you know, uh, it, it, there, there, are, there, there are restrictions on this. And of course, it's much more nuanced than this. Um, so let, let's talk about how and why this would happen, okay? So, you know, we could all agree that language exists in many ways, right? Um, it exists as a social entity. It exists as an environmental entity. But it also has a manifestation in this black box right here in the mind and brain, okay? And functionally, I'm going to make a distinction today. When I talk about the mind, I'm talking about the psychological processes of how the physical organ is used. So the brain is the organ itself, and I'm going to show you pictures of a brain, and then I'm really talking about a brain. When I talk about behavioral outcomes, I'm talking about the mind in a psychological sense, okay? So here's how this would actually work, right? The idea is that when you have more than one language in the mind, you have multiple representations that exist in competition with each other. Now imagine this, you're bilingual. How many of you are bilingual? Just raise your hand in the audience, wherever you are. Okay, most of you are bilingual. Um, and at a moment's notice, you don't necessarily know how you're going to use those languages or need those languages. So for example, it might be the case that I walk into Zeynep, who's sitting here, her office, and she has to switch to English and her phone rings and her husband and it's Turkish and whatever. So just like a car in winter in Norway, if you park it outside, it's nice to turn it on 10 minutes before you leave, right? Because then it's actually ready to be used. But language can't work like that, right? We, don't, we can't predict. We know we have to go to the office, right? But we don't necessarily know when we're going to use language. So what the brain does, a lifetime of that, by the way, it has a lot of experience, you have to leave the language that is not contextually relevant idle. You have to kind of leave it just warming up but you need to use mental processes to be able to manage those two systems, to inhibit the language that you don't need in a particular context and activate the other language and switch that at a moment's notice, okay? Because it takes all of bring and picking up the phone for really good bilinguals to switch, okay? This is a mental gymnasium. And the balance of this over time, the tension between inhibiting one language and activating the other, both languages and research is very clear on this, all your languages are always simultaneously activated at a resting level or at a highly active level. And that's like this fantastic exercise. If you go to the gym, you don't just wanna do this, you want resistance in both directions. And this happens all the time that you're awake. You can imagine your brain is a muscle, just like your biceps are if you go to the gym. That mental exercise over time, not on purpose, it just happens potentially has some outcomes for that muscle that may or may not be beneficial. Okay, so what is the consequence of this parallel activity over time? Um, and it's, it's generally, it's discussed, let's say, the, the parameters by which this would be the case. Resolving cross-language competition is hypothesized, at least under particular conditions. I'm going to show you some research that we've done that, that really hammers this home, to have knock-on effects for cognition, and that's behavior, and the brain itself. So that's its structure and function. And I'm going to show you some stuff specifically to structure and function. Um, what you see in this picture is the executive function system or the executive system. And imagine this in your brain. These, these are constructs, they're conceptual constructs, but your brain is also a beautifully awesome computer, if you will. Um, and this, imagine that your executive system is like the motherboard, 
okay, that allows you to do the things that you need and uh, uh, divide, uh, uh, alloc allocate and divide the resources of the tension and focus and memory and things like that. And those are part of the executive system, okay? Um, it might be that an outcome of this for bilingualism, at least under certain conditions, allows bilinguals to ignore relevant information better on average to monolinguals, resolve conflict among competing alternatives, and imagine these things overlap with what you're having to do with the two languages, not only stopping them, but stopping them from, from affecting each other too much, um, minimize costs associated with task switching, because they're switching between languages all the time, and have multifarious effects for the mind and the brain across the lifespan. Okay, let's try a simple task. I'm gonna, uh, uh, so we test this, uh, uh, we test this by using um, simple tasks, uh, tasks that relate to um, various executive functions. In this case, it's inhibition. Um, and I'm gonna, we're gonna do one together. So you're gonna hear, if you're listening to this recording, you're gonna hear the audience, they're gonna yell out colors. So you're gonna see colors in blocks and all you need to do, yell out in English, please. So you're already, you're already mental exercising if it's not your native language, what the color is. And this is called a Stroop task. Okay, was that easy? Do you all think that was easy? It's pretty easy, right? Okay, maybe a little more difficult if it's not your native language, but pretty easy. Now what I want you to do is I do want you to just read the words as fast as you can. Okay, was that easy? Just as easy as the first one? Okay, great. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna have a third version. Focusing on the color of the word. Say the color out loud as quickly as you can. Okay, that was perfect. This, this was amazing. And it, it actually underlies the point that I'm making, right? So what you had to do in this troop task and what, what, what just happened with those of you heard that the, the yelling and the rapidity with which uh, this was coming out, of course, was, was quite different from the first two blocks, okay? And this Stroop effect has to do with um, incongruency, right? So basically what you had in the first block is all you had to do was access a lexical word, right, from a visual stimuli. In the second, uh, it might've even been easier because there was a congruence effect between the color, the visual cue, and the now language cue, which which is the word. In the third block, we have non-congruence or incongruence. And that is, you now need to inhibit one of the stimuli in favor of the other. And their lack of congruency makes that task a lot harder. On average, bilinguals are better at doing that. It emulates the inhibitory processes that are involved in doing that 15 hours a day while they're awake all the time, okay? Now, I have to say, this doesn't always show up. It does depend. It, it, it's, it's not something that is necessarily reliably found. It is under certain conditions reliably found, but it's not bilingualism equals, and I'll get into that a little bit as well, okay? But on average, bilinguals are seemingly better, especially at particular ages, and I'm about to show you that now, okay? Okay, so um, what you should focus on here, now this is actually data on assignment tasks done. Um, this is a study looking at this and uh, the relative magnitude assignment effects across decades between monolinguals and bilinguals. So bilinguals are in the red um, and the yellow dots, hopefully you can see them, is the line of progression for monolinguals, okay? And this is assignment test, a similar task. You know, it's about congruency and incongruency. These are standardized tests used in psychology all the time, not necessarily to correlate to language, but to um, you know, um, inhibitory processing, you know, in general. Okay, um, and so what you can see here is that there is not much of a difference, a little difference between bilinguals and monolinguals. By the way, you know, a hundred milliseconds in the, in this world is not insignificant. Later, you can ask me, and the question is, well, what's the practical? Okay, that's that's a different story. But already, what you can see is even at thirty, bilinguals are faster, okay? Bilinguals are better. But what's really interesting is how the slope of degeneration changes, okay? So cognitive, we all 
Unfortunately, our brains all age as we do. And as our brains age, our cognitive dexterity dwindles in a natural sense, okay? I'm still in the peak performance, but I have only a couple years left before the lines start to diverge for me as well. Um, and so what you see here is that up until the age of mid fifties, more or less, bilinguals and monolinguals are steadily slightly different from each other, okay? But again, the bilinguals, 100 milliseconds is not insignificant in this type of task. But what you start to see is that the decline, the natural decline of cognitive aging, which everybody goes through, this is not Alzheimer's, this is not dementia, I'm gonna show you a little bit about that in a second, but the natural decline the slope of that is much less in tasks of this type than it is uh, in, in bilinguals on average than it is for monolinguals, at least bilinguals who are highly proficient under certain circumstances of engaging the mechanisms, the mental mechanisms of bilingualism. So there are numerous effects of this and bilingualism because cognitive aging is something we all don't want to go through, but it's very expensive for society. In fact, to give a little plug, we hope we're gonna get a very nice grant that studies this and other things related to cognitive aging and bilingualism um, soon. Okay, so now what about, because we've all heard that bilingualism cures, um, bilingualism cures Alzheimer's, right? Some of you said that. No, it doesn't, okay? It, it doesn't cure Alzheimer's at all. Um, so what you can see in the image, just to kind of uh, contextualize it for you, um, you see a healthy brain, the bigger, the plumper brain, and you see quite an advanced, that, that, that's quite an advanced Alzheimer's brain in the bisection of the brain. What you can see is Alzheimer's affects the, the integrity of the brain. It affects the two, uh, it, it affects both the gray matter and the white matter of the brain. Um, and this is what we, we need to do all the functions that, that we have, okay? It affects the highways, which is the white matter, and the integrity structure of the brain, which is the gray matter, okay? Um, and so research, you know, about 15, going on 15, maybe even close to 20 years now, had, had noticed through, through um, patient record studies, and in some cases, very large patient record studies, that bilinguals were much older on average when they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So what the original research actually says is that, and some of these studies are looking at thousands of people's patient records, that bilinguals were typically on average four to five years older at the time of diagnosis. Bilingualism does not stop the decay and it doesn't cure the disease. What bilingualism seems to do is provide compensation for the symptoms at the behavioral level. Bilinguals seem to be able to use what's called a cognitive reserve to compensate at the behavioral level. Now at present, that's fantastic news because there is no good treatment for Alzheimer's. In the future, when there's treatment, we don't know because that means that they don't get checked as soon as, uh, as uh, monolinguals do. When you compare later studies, compared the neuroimaging of people who have Alzheimer's and are bilingual to monolinguals, the placking that you see and the atrophy to the brain is much more severe in bilinguals juxtaposed against their systems because their symptoms, sorry, because of that compensation. So right now it's fantastic. It's not stopping the progression at all. It is compensating for the progression, for the symptoms of the progression. Fantastic news if you or your grandparents will know you for five years longer, wouldn't we agree, okay? Okay, um, here, I, I wanna say, give a little plug to a new postdoc that's gonna join us in a couple weeks. Um, and this is something that, that he is really passionate about and we've been, we've been working on. Um, and this is to understand if, if what is true and what I just told you about bilingualism might generalize to neurocognitive diseases in general, if that neurocognitive disease has an overlap in mechanisms with executive functions that are similar to Alzheimer's. And these include um, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis. And so in this recent paper, it really just came out last month, what we do is we lay out a program, but also the underlying theory and the overlap in the mechanisms that gives rise to a program to be able to test the extendability of this compensation. Again, it wouldn't be curing these diseases. It would be 
understanding the relative compensation. And without good good uh, intervention for these for these um, for these types of diseases, how easy would it be to say language learning, even in monolingual societies, will at least give you a qualitative boost in your life down the road? Okay, um, okay. So um, here's actually some really interesting work, um, and this is done uh, with. It, one of the authors, the first author in particular, is Jubin Abudalebi, who is one of the Professor Twos um, in the Akfa Aurora Center um, and, and, one of, and one of the principal people in theme four. Uh, um, and uh, this work is really actually, I think, quite important. And this is a somewhat older paper now. It's eight years old in the world of science. That's a little old. But what this paper actually shows you is, because remember we talked about how there's all these behavioral outcomes, right? They are better at inhibitory control. They're better at a Stroop task. Um, Sometimes they're not. And we want to understand what does that mean, okay? So when you look at behavior alone, if somebody does quantifiably better compared to somebody else on a particular task, you might be missing something, something really essential. So what this paper, and it's one of the first papers to show, to show this, is that in doing a particular uh, a task, so this is functional MRI, and in functional MRI, you're doing a task-based type of effect. And what you're seeing here in the areas that, quote, light up, is the relative involvement of that particular area. And I'm going to say this in a, a, a lay way, but you can translate that to the recruitment or the end energy that the brain is exuding in that particular area for a particular task, okay? And this is doing one of those tasks like the Stroop and the Simon tasks that I talked about before. What's very interesting is you see on at least my right, which might be opposite to you, monolinguals in blue, you see that the area that's implicated, and by the way, all areas that are highlighted in these brain pictures overlap between executive control systems and language control processes. That's how we know, or we're pretty certain that this stuff does relate to bilingualism itself. What you see in the monolinguals, you see it's brighter and it's bigger. So more of that area is being involved and recruited and it's more intense. And we're used to thinking bigger's better, brighter's better, isn't it? Not all the time. The bilinguals in those same areas show less recruitment and less energy exposed. Let me ask you this question. If you were to run a marathon and you finish it three hours and 10 minutes and I finish it three hours and 10 minutes, we tied, right? So at the behavioral level, the bilinguals and the monolinguals were not different in their task performance, okay? They performed, I can't remember quite the task, but they performed the cognitive task exactly the same. Without the brain data, you might say, well, there's, no, there's nothing about bilingualism then, right? But when you look under the hood, you see more efficiency. So going back to my marathon running, if we finish at 310, but what if I didn't break a sweat and you are passed out on the floor? Who did a better run, even if we finish at the same time? Probably the person who's laughing and going, oh, what's wrong with you, okay? And that's basically what you see here. So what you see here is that they're doing the task behaviorally the same, but the bilinguals are recruiting a lot less effort at the brain level to do the same task. They are, and their brains are, more efficient. You need to look under the hood to be able to understand efficiency. Behavior is great, but there's more than just behavior, okay? Um, this is, uh, I think, finally with specific studies. Um, uh, th this was published last year, um, and uh, what, what we did here was we, we looked at um, we looked at bilingualism in a, in a, in a highly diffuse and, 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 and uh, specific way where we understood it as a spectrum of experiences. So instead of just saying bilingualism equals X, we want to know what about bilingualism. We want to know why some labs don't find effects and other labs reliably find effects. Or some types of bilinguals uh, seemingly have more outcomes of the like that I'm talking than others. And is it the case that if you're a simultaneous bilingual, will you automatically get it? Well, the answer from this paper, which, you know, without tooting any horns has been quite well received in the year that it's been out, is no. 
You have to understand what about the engagement and the intensity and the use of bilingualism um, and how that's implicated in these changes at the behavioral level and at the brain level. So what we showed here is that patterns of regional volume or shape have been shown to correlate with different language experiences in brain regions used specifically for language processing and control. Again, telling us this really is about bilingualism, but the intensity and the gain themselves, either them be them efficiencies or expansions of particular brain areas, you see both highlighted here, um, relate, correlate very nicely to the amount and the context of use of bilingualism, whether it's only used at home, whether it's used in social context, how much you switch between the languages, and so on and so forth. So it's about engagement of that system, which makes sense. We could all go to the gym and exercise, but your intensity matters for the outcome. That might seem simplistic, but it wasn't known before, okay? Okay, um, and I'm actually nearing finishing, so let me just give you an interim, uh, interim summary and then finish up. Uh, skilled bilinguals are often highly efficient code switchers, so they mix between the two languages in appropriate contexts of other bilingual speakers. This ability suggests that they have developed a truly impressive mechanism of cognitive control. The more you switch, the more you have to inhibit, release inhibition, inhibit, release inhibition. Okay, having both languages active simultaneously produces competition, which acts as an exerciser for the brain. By the way, I should say, any cognitively complex and intense task has the same effects. There's nothing magic about bilingualism. The difference is, is that if you happen to be bilingual, it happens all the time. This happens for pilots. This happens for taxi drivers because of the spatial navigation that's required. But people are bilingual all the time they're awake and nobody's driving a taxi 24 hours a day, okay? A life of resolving cross-language competition seemingly confers positive changes in the cognitive systems and, the, and physiological modifications to the brain. The evidence to date is largely correlational, as I've mentioned throughout, right? Bilingualism doesn't default equal a cognitive advantage without qualification of individual factors. As we proposed in that last paper um, I, I mentioned, um, what we propose is a better way to conceive of this question is to ask, what aspects of bilingualism correlate best with cognitive effects and brain effects, brain structural effects and connectivity effects, in which groups and at what ages? Are they active use of both languages, high degree of engagement and investment, degree of code switching, younger and especially older ages show the greatest effects of, for obvious reasons, in cognition. So in behavioral studies, you see the greatest effects in young children and in adults, because neither of them are at peak cognition. Children grow into peak cognition, and adults are slowly, sadly, moving away from peak cognition. So behavioral effects in the middle of the lifespan, what most of our studies are populated with because of access to college students, somehow doesn't leave the granularity of cognitive tests alone. So looking under the hood with the methods that we've discussed is, is quite recommendable and good. I don't want to say that everything's roses, so I just want to highlight a couple things. There are some trade-offs. I use the word disadvantage, I don't know. Trade-offs of bilingualism. When compared to monolinguals, bilinguals have smaller vocabulary sizes. They almost always do, especially young children. When you add the two vocabularies together, then of course it far exceeds that of monolinguals. Bilinguals can experience increased difficulties in understanding speech under constrained contexts, like when there's a lot of background noise, especially in their less dominant language. Bilinguals experience more tip of the tongue moments than monolingual speakers because that system of engagement and disengagement is not always perfect, right? So the uh and not finding the word. Uh, bilingual children may say their first word slightly later than monolingual children uh, or have what can appear to be slower growth curves. But as I mentioned before, they catch up. So this is all about choices. I want to just give you some practical um, practical choices and some things to think about as we finish up with our last two slides. So first we need to manage our expectations, okay? Choosing one or another language is a false dichotomy. I hope I've convinced you of that. How we manage having more than one can require effective planning and prioritizing, especially when the society itself is not bilingual and that's not the default way things are. There is no doubt that successful bilingualism is possible and 
has benefits at multiple levels. Even if you find too controversial, the cognitive ones, because it's still young, we really can't deny the social and the economic ones. They are quantifiable in a different way. We do not need to have one golden standard as the point of comparison for bilinguals. Communicative competence, understanding also is what matters. Who cares if you can't speak properly to your grandparents, if you can understand them? I think that that has a lot of value. It's okay if your bilingual children are different from speakers in other contexts. It would be odd if they weren't, the reality is different. And then almost finally, some points to take home. There are many types of bilinguals. Many factors contribute to the outcomes of bilingualism at the linguistic, social, economic, and of course, the cognitive and neural level. The unfolding of bilingualism has a time course for some aspects that cannot be circumvented. It's an investment and you have to be patient. Effective bilingualism is not guaranteed. This is a long-term investment and those that endure reap the benefits the most. So-called advantages of bilingualism are not, are not confined to specific subtypes of bilinguals, but effect sizes can vary. It's not too late to engage the system. Like it's not too late for you to go to the gym. Even if you're 50, it's okay. The effects might be different. If you were 30, you might enjoy what you look like a little bit better, but still go to the gym, okay? And determining what aspects of the bilingual experience correlate with advantageous effects of bilingualism over the lifespan is an important part of contemporary research. And at Aqua Aurora, we're very happy to contribute to that and continue to do so. Of course, none of this happens without a lot of people, including the people at the bottom who you saw in the videos. So Gustavo and Maki and Jorge and Isabel and Alicia and many other people who, who contributed to this. I, we wanna thank you, um, especially the department that houses us, uh, ISK, so the Department of Languages and Culture. Of course, that exists in a different structure, the Faculty of Humanity, Social Science and Education, all of whom have been extremely supportive financially and otherwise, and the university itself. So the UI, UIT, the Arctic University in Norway. And with that, be safe. These are weird times. I would have preferred to have done this in person with all of you. Be safe and thank you for listening.